Welcome to the China in the World podcast, a series of discussions examining China's foreign policy and shifting engagement with the world. The China in the World podcast is brought to you by Carnegie China and hosted by me, Paul Hanley. Welcome back to the China in the World podcast. Today, we're launching a new series to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the China in the World podcast. Over the last 10 years, I've been fortunate to conduct over 180 interviews, both in person at the Carnegie Center in Beijing, as well as virtually, with leading scholars and experts on China, U.S.-China relations, and international affairs. To celebrate 10 years of the China in the World podcast, I'll be publishing a series of look-back episodes to help put current international issues in context. In today's episode, I look back on 10 years of U.S.-China diplomacy. The China in the World podcast has spanned three administrations and coincided with several notable diplomatic meetings, such as President Obama and Xi Jinping's No Necktie Summit in Sunnylands, California in June 2013, as well as Xi Jinping's meeting with Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago in April 2017. Today's episode helps shed light on what can be accomplished during high-level diplomatic meetings, what went right during the past meetings, what went wrong, and gives a glimpse into how U.S.-China relations have evolved over a pivotal decade in the bilateral relationship. I hope our listeners enjoy this episode and tune in next month for another China in the World Look Back episode. Enjoy. President Obama and Chinese President Xi wrapped up their Sunnyland Summit with a late morning stroll in the California desert. Over two days, the leaders met for a total of eight hours. I'm very much looking forward to this being uh, a strong foundation for the kind of new model of cooperation uh, that we can establish for years to come. The summit, held just four months after Xi took office, meant to launch a close new relationship with a new Chinese leader. And at present, the China-U.S. relationship has reached a new historical starting point. In the following interview, recorded in Beijing in November 2013, I spoke with Steve Hadley, former National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush. Is it natural that our two countries will move to this new type of major country relations, or are there factors that you think could threaten the realization of this new framework? It is uh, going to be difficult. It will require the leaders of both countries to continue to have the vision and commitment to the relationship that successive generations of Chinese and American leaders have had over the last 40 years. The Chinese people, uh, I think many of them will think that China is now a great power and it is time for China to put itself forward and the rest of the world, if you will, pay homage to China. That's a formulation that will not work and is really not in the best interests of China, which depends for its continued development and growth on interdependence and uh, successful economic and trade relations with its neighbors. Similarly, on the American side, Americans will see, many many Americans will see China's emergence and its uh, overwhelming economic power as a real threat to American interests and will fear that China is seeking to displace uh, the United States and bully its neighbors. The next recording comes from an interview with Professor Xia Tao from the School of International Relations at Beijing Foreign Studies University, recorded in May 2014. What progress do you think has been made on defining this new concept of a new type of great power relationship? Well, in terms of defining the concept, Um, I think there's more struggle on the Chinese side than on the American side Mm. about what exactly is meant by this uh, new model of great power relationship. Because the Chinese first proposed this idea, and so it's incumbent upon the Chinese leaders and scholars to tell Americans, you know, what do you mean by this? Mm -hmm. I think so far our focus has been, I think, two things. No confrontation and cooperation, right? No confrontation, like the former Soviet Union time and also mutual benefit Mm -hmm. uh, cooperation. I think the Chinese leadership and Chinese scholars really want to get American um, policymakers and officials to to accept this idea. But my own sense is that 
there is a much much cooler reception to this idea on the American side mm. than on the, on the Chinese side. In the following interview recorded at Tsinghua University in June 2014, I spoke with Dr. Yen Shui Tong one year after President Obama and Xi Jinping's meeting in Sunny Lands, California. Each side uh, and still do not have experience and about this uh, uh, new relationship between the rising power and the status power. We want to have this kind of relationship different from what we know in the history. That means uh, we want to create something we never know. So this is uh, really a, a new thing. So that's why it's uh, difficult. The most positive part is that the, the leaders of both sides and uh, uh, quite uh, positive on this idea. And uh, uh, generally speaking, from my understanding, they agree with each other. They regard it as a very necessary for prevent a confrontation between China and the U.S. And uh, from my understanding, there are some more problems at the working uh, bureaucratic level rather than at the political leadership level. The U.S. President Barack Obama is talking trade in China as he kicks off a week-long tour around Asia. Barack Obama says that the world will benefit if America and China manage to strengthen their economic ties. Earlier, he spoke at a meeting for chief executives at the APEC gathering taking place in Beijing. The United States welcomes the rise of a prosperous, peaceful, and stable China. In fact, over recent decades, the United States has worked to help integrate China into the global economy. In the next audio clip, I interviewed Randy Shriver, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, about President Obama's trip to Asia for the APEC leaders meeting in December 2014. I want to start out our discussion by just asking you for your impressions of President Obama's trip to Asia. What do you think the significant uh, accomplishments were? What was he trying to achieve as well? Thank you. I, I think from where I sit, it looks like a very successful visit. I think a lot of people um, in the region and, and really around the world like to see us coming together and cooperating. Um, but, but there's still some pretty hard work ahead to, to fully implement these agreements, and, and mm -hmm. you know, time will tell if we've gone mm -hmm. past. Um, we, we, to some extent, it looks like our leaders are still talking past one another when they present their view for the future security architecture of the region. And that's ultimately going to inform the relationship more mm -hmm. than any particular area of cooperation or agreement. From where I sit, it looks like we're on a trajectory for sort of longer-term competition. Good morning. Good morning. Ni hao. <laughs> President Xi, Madam Pong, Members of the Chinese delegation, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. And on behalf of the American people, welcome to the United States. In the next interview, I spoke with Dr. Evan Medeiros, former senior director and special assistant for Asian affairs under President Obama, about President Xi's state visit to Washington, D.C. in the fall of 2015. You mentioned the state visit, um, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. President Xi Jinping will visit the U.S. next week. His first stop will be in Seattle, and then he'll go on to Washington for a state dinner and a meeting with President Obama. Could you uh, give our listeners a sense of what your expectations are for the visit? Well, having been through uh, three of these big summits between President Obama and his Chinese counterpart, I have modest expectations. I think, first and foremost, the most important element of any of these visits is ensuring that there's plenty of time for both leaders to have extended discussion about the major strategic priorities in the U.S.-China relationship. It's difficult to overstate the importance of that sort of uh, interaction between the President of the United States and the President of China to really work through the uh, complexity of the relationship in order to expand cooperation and manage uh, competition. The channels of communication uh, across the relationship are broader and deeper than they've ever been before. We know the Chinese and they know us. We also have built up a very solid track record. Uh, the U.S. and China over the last seven years have worked through some difficult issues. We have uh, resolved crises and we have a good track record of uh, working to together 
to solve important problems. Uh, North Korea's nuclear program, Iran's nuclear program, climate change, uh, etc. Fundamental question at the heart of the relationship, which is what kind of rising power is China going to be? Is China going to adhere to international norms that have been well accepted for decades, or is China going to seek to revise those rules in ways that um, support China's narrow interests? And so uh, work on the South China Sea issue and the cyber issue is going to need to be done over the next 18 months so these don't become uh, corrosive issues that undermine the overall stability of the relationship and uh, put us on a path to inevitable rivalry. The next recording comes from an interview in November 2016 with Dr. Zhao Hai, scholar at the National Strategy Institute at Tsinghua University, about China's reactions to Donald Trump's election as president and the implications for U.S.-China relations. So yesterday when I was walking into the embassy for the uh, gathering to watch the, the election returns, I was walking in with a Chinese scholar. And I said, it looks like uh, Trump may win this. And he said, let's hope so. And I was surprised at the response. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, many of us scholars have come to the view that from a geopolitical standpoint, mm -hmm. Trump would be better. Yeah. Why have Chinese scholars come to that view? My personal uh, opinion, there's a divide between um, the foreign policy realm and the economic and business realm. So there's a lot of uh, people from the economic perspective saying that Trump's presidency may hurt U.S.-China economic relationship, may hurt the um, uh, globalization and, and free trade. But on the other hand, you have people on the uh, geopolitical and, and security side thinking that maybe Trump's presidency is good. And on the geopolitical side, is it because Trump, the candidate, has indicated uh, or has, has left the impression that the United States will draw inward? And from that standpoint, there'll be less pressure on China, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, no, I, I think there are m many clear-minded scholars thinking mm -hmm. that American retraction uh, or um, uh, the trend towards isolationism may not be a good thing for China. Because when the U.S. is uh, a big pillar for the current international system and China benefited uh, from the current uh, international system. President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping landed in Florida Thursday, the start of their two-day summit in Mar-a-Lago. But it won't be all sun and games at the golf resort. Their first face-to-face -face meeting will be a diplomatic test for Mr. Trump, who was highly critical of China on the campaign trail. The top priorities on the agenda are trade and North Korea, which sent a reminder of its nuclear ambitions earlier this week when it launched another ballistic missile into the waters off its coast. The following audio clip comes from an interview with with Ashley Tellis, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and was recorded in April 2017. So I think China has two clear objectives going into the summit in Mar-a-Lago. First is to arrive at a political modus vivendi with the United States that has a G2-like connotations, mm. even if they declaim any interest in mm. a G2-like arrangement. Get Trump's consent mm -hmm. uh, to treat China as a peer, in exchange for which China would be willing to do many things to advance right. its domestic economic agenda. But there is a second objective that the Chinese have as well, and that is to entice Trump to do whatever he can to protect globalization, at least to the degree that it allows China continued access, unimpeded access to external markets. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think the Chinese are apostles of globalization in an abstract sense. They need it. But they, they need, need no. continued uninterrupted access to global markets. In the next audio recording, I interviewed Professor Jia Daozhong from his office at Beijing University in April 2017. I think it'd be very helpful for the listeners of this China in the World podcast, which is a broad international audience, to, to hear your perspectives of the context of the summit in China's broader domestic and foreign policy environment, in terms of the events taking place in Beijing this year, in terms of the 19th Party Congress, which will take place in the fall, and also in terms of President Xi's foreign policy agenda for the next six months. There is that demand from the Chinese political circles uh, 
the demand would be something like this. Okay, Mr. Xi, why don't you go and talk to the Americans' uh, leadership face to face, but you also have the uh, responsibility on your shoulder to show they listen to you. At least among those who are even know about US-China relations, we never really expected the ties, the management of the ties to be so difficult or so out of control. Mm. If you look at the, the history of uh, these interactions, both Americans and Chinese are amendable, and uh, they both you know, have demonstrated a good measure of pragmatism. I do feel uh, uh, the way it ended um, and the announcements made mm -hmm. to, uh, try to project an image of stability. And I think the totality of the meeting, the result of the meeting is that they are ready to work with each other. The next recording comes from an interview with Danny Russell, former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs. Danny and I discussed the outcomes of President Trump's first visit to Asia in November 2017, including his summit in Beijing with Xi Jinping. Continuing to China and having another or second uh, sustained uh, bilateral summit with Xi Jinping also tracks very much with the uh, sunny lands type of uh, personal high-level diplomacy that President Obama championed. And continuing uh, first to the APEC uh, economic summit in uh, Vietnam, and then on to the U.S. ASEAN summit in uh, Manila and the East Asia summit, although the president may have left a, a bit early, he still pretty much made it there. Um, those are precisely the things that uh, President Obama did and would have done and things that I recommended or would have recommended for uh, President Trump. Now, what I uh, perhaps wouldn't have recommended is in some of the content of the messages. Yeah. What we heard from President Trump, not only during the presidential campaign and after taking office, but also in his remarks at uh, the APEC uh, leaders meeting, was a kind of uh, go it alone, every man for himself, an, e an economic nationalism, you might say, that's uh, of a piece with America first. Now, of course, as he and others have pointed out, uh, there's no leader of a nation who doesn't uh, put the priority on defending and advancing uh, the best interests of his own country. That's a given. But a quintessential quality of leadership, and the leadership that the U.S. has historically demonstrated, is convincingly showing that you are taking into account the best interests of the entire group, or frankly, the entire world. In the following interview, I spoke with the current National Security Advisor to President Biden, Jake Sullivan, about U.S. global leadership. My interview with Jake was conducted in December 2017, prior to Jake joining the Biden administration, when Jake was a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment. We're pleased this morning to have with us Jake Sullivan, who's visiting from the United States, visiting us here at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center in Beijing. If you think back to the previous two administrations, a Republican and a Democratic administration, uh, we all worked hard to build a foundation uh, that said there's going to be some features to American leadership. One is that we are going to stand for a set of universal values. Two is we are going to invest in the institutions of this region because yeah. we think that that is the way that you're going to promote an open and fair trading system, the way you're going to promote collective problem solving for these challenges that no one country can solve on their own. And it's going to be the way that we encourage China to become a more responsible player and to rise into a rules-based system that, that works for everyone. Um, and I think walking away from that or not seeing the value in that, um, you know, maybe the cost isn't present 
you know, when he got on the plane to fly home, but that cost will become apparent over time. In November 2018, I spoke with Dr. Tsui Li Ru, former president of the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, otherwise known as Kicker, about rising competition in U.S.-China relations. President Trump had launched a trade war with China earlier in 2018, in March, and just prior to my interview with Tsui Li Ru, Vice President Mike Pence had delivered a speech marking the clearest articulation to that point of the Trump administration's policy toward China, which included a significant hardening of the U.S. position. Now we are in a transitional period between China and the United States. Mm -hmm. In this period, the strategic competition becomes prominent because, as I pointed out earlier, the United States has been the dominant role in these areas, including its uh, align system and its uh, uh, very close relations with uh, of, uh, some of the China's neighbors in these areas. So uh, when China's uh, rising up, its influence is rising up, sometimes it constitutes a kind of competition between the different interests and the influence. This is the one area. Mm -hmm. Some others with China has some difference in di disputes with some of our American allies. And uh, then when the tensions uh, uh, grow in the American, sometimes in, because of various reasons in, the, in being involved in this kind of situation, that becomes another area of competitions. And also uh, recently we see the competitions also including these uh, economic trade relations. And uh, this is different than before. Before, for many years, China-U.S. economic relations uh, is regarded as uh, the pillar. The pillar, and also its its complementary relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, China becomes more competitive in some mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. Then Americans believe this competitiveness could constitute some kind of challenges to the U.S. dominance. We had a strategic dialogue for many years, mm -hmm. but my view is this dialogue were not very effective. Mm -hmm. They just have that kind of dialogue mainly to make the argument for themselves mm -hmm. and do not have a very much that kind of effective dialogue to understand and learn the other side. Mm. Um, my opinion is that uh, the best we can do is to manage our differences. The next recording comes from an interview conducted in 2018 with Dr. Graham Allison, director of the Belfer Center at Harvard's Kennedy School. We discussed the implications of China's rise for the United States. In one of your recent articles, you wrote, can we invent a new concept that combines ruthless competition in some areas with deep cooperation in others. How do you think about this question? And I ask that because, as you and I talked about this morning, I served in the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And yes, we had areas of disagreement with China, but we also tried to identify areas of common interest and build cooperation. We thought that was an important element. That seems to be absent today. It's much more about competition, even confrontation. Is it possible? to have a relationship where you have intense competition, but you cooperate at the same time? Oh, God, that's a great question, and I think that's actually the heart of the matter. Mm. So Washington today, as you say, has gone through this wake-up, as they think of it, mm. to a rising, risen China that is now rivaling the U.S. across the board. And the Washington consensus, not just uh, the Trump administration, but across the political spectrum, Democrats and Republicans alike, it's pretty much moved to a new uh, Washington consensus. Mm. And the consensus is uh, uh, we made a cosmic bet. We bet that China was going to modernize, become wealthier, therefore liberalize, therefore have individual rights of the sort that we understand, therefore have a democracy, and therefore take its place in the American-led international order. That is, China would basically follow in the footsteps of Japan and Germany and grow up to be like us and to take their place at our table, at which we're the 
with the chairman. Uh, and uh, as Lee Kuan Yew said, and I quote him in my book, uh, uh, that was a rather naive view. In the following interview, recorded in June 2018, I spoke with Ambassador Bill Burns, who at the time was the president of the Carnegie Endowment, about how the U.S. can balance competition and cooperation with China. Just as you said, Paul, I mean, the single most consequential phenomenon on the international landscape today is China's rise. As you know, history is full of collisions between rising powers like China and established powers like the United States. I think if we're honest with ourselves, mm -hmm. there is that risk. I don't, however, think it's foreordained. I don't mm -hmm. think it's inevitable. So the challenge for statecraft, for diplomacy, um, is how do you build a stable mix of competition and cooperation in relations between the U.S. and China? Because both of those elements are going to apply. Um, and that means everything from engaging in an honest conversation mm -hmm. about the structural challenges in our economic relationship through uh, finding ways in which we can work together on crucial geopolitical issues like North Korea's nuclear and missile program through managing some very real differences, whether it's over Taiwan or the South China Sea. That is a, a very significant task. In fact, there's none more significant sure. on the international stage today. In the next clip, recorded in November 2018, I interviewed Doug Paul, who at the time was Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment, about U.S.-China relations ahead of Trump and Xi's meeting on the sidelines of the G20 in Buenos Aires. Uh, later this month, uh, President Trump and President Xi will meet on the sidelines of the G20 meeting in Argentina. All eyes will be on that meeting, of course, uh, to see if the two presidents can do anything to cool things down. Um, and there's an increasingly a view that given the current state of tensions, it's really only the two leaders that can find mm -hmm. a way forward. What do you expect from this meeting? Well, my expectations are fairly low. I think that the, as as we discussed at the top of the broadcast, the podcast, the, um, the there's no mandate coming out of the American elections to really do something. Um, there's a there's a lot of in in the, for President Trump politically to keep the pressure on China. It's a bipartisan support in the U.S. to get some real change from Chinese on how they behave in their own marketplace and how they behave internationally on trade and economic fronts let alone the areas of science and technology and intellectual property theft and uh, strategic competition. And so the, um, uh, th there's not a big incentive to reach a large agreement. I think there's some incentive mm -hmm. to manage things for the time being. Mm. The next audio clip comes from an interview in April 2019 with Susan Thornton, former Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, about ongoing U.S.-China trade negotiations. One of the things that's sort of out there uh, in the realm of the immediate is this trade deal and these mm -hmm. trade negotiations that yeah. are taking place. And we've talked a lot about those this week during your time out here. How important is this at this particular juncture for the U.S. and China to get a trade deal? And what needs to be in the deal for it to be a success from a U.S. standpoint? I think it's pretty important to get some kind of a success marked in this relationship uh, in the pretty near future. So, And right now, the only thing we're really talking about with China is this trade deal. So uh, I think it's pretty important that we be able to show that we can work together, that we can have a negotiation, that we can reach a successful conclusion, that we can get some progress on various issues. Uh, of course, the trade deal that we've been working on will also help push forward China's reform and opening, which um, is something that has been at the center of our effort to engage China from the beginning. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. ingredient in whatever deal comes out. So that means that a deal can't just be about purchases. It also has to be about reforms and opening and a lot of the structural issues that people have raised, mm -hmm. things like regulations on foreign investment, open and open, more open market access, uh, no forced transfer of technology, mm -hmm. forced joint ventures, protection for intellectual property rights. In the next interview, taped in September 2020, I spoke with Dr. Jia Dale, School of International Studies at Beijing University. We discussed the state of U.S.-China relations during the COVID-19 global pandemic. <laughs> 
you know, I want to talk a little bit, if I could, about strategic cooperation and COVID-19. Returning to your article that you wrote on ideology and strategic competition, you explored an idea as the need for strategic cooperation grows, the negative impact of differing political systems and ideologies lessens. But by this logic, of course, Jed Ale, one would yeah. could expect that the outbreak of the coronavirus would be an issue that would force the U.S. and China to put aside their differences and cooperate. And indeed, many had predicted that a global pandemic would be a unifying force between the two countries. But of course, that was not and has not been the outcome that we've seen so far. Sure, I think it's as we can see, it is very unfortunate development between China and the U.S. and also for the rest of the world because of the the pandemic is basically global right now. And, you know, people say that if China and U.S. cannot cooperate on tackling issues like a pandemic, you know, what else can they cooperate on? Because as, as you said, it's an area where supposedly countries can cooperate easily. So I think, of course, the, the general context of U.S.-China relations explains a little bit the dynamics during the pandemic. I think because, you know, the two countries are already starting from late you know, 2017 and, and early 2018 with the Trump administration national security strategy report and national defense strategy Report. I think the kind of grudgingly, China you know, never uses officially the phrase of a strategic competition or similar terms, but Beijing has to gradually face up to the reality that two countries are entering a new phase of strategic competition. In April 2020, during the early days of the pandemic, I interviewed Dr. Evan Feigenbaum, current vice president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We discussed the prospects for U.S.-China cooperation in dealing with the COVID-19 virus. Frankly, you know, strategic tension between the U.S. and China isn't new. If you think about how the relationship started, when Richard Nixon went to China in 1972, China was just crawling out of the Cultural Revolution. The United States and China were still fighting a proxy war in Vietnam. It was a hot yeah. war. And so ever since the inception, they've had divergent political systems, big ideological differences. They've been security competitors. So that part of it isn't new. But what is new is that through all of that period, despite the strategic tensions, they found ways, if not to cooperate, at least to coordinate on mm -hmm. complementary although not always common interests, on threats to global stability of a particular magnitude, velocity, and nature. So mm -hmm. when I mm -hmm. think back to the kinds of crises that have occurred in the last 20 years, things like the financial crisis of 2008 mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. threatened global contagion and probably the worst economic collapse since the Great Depression of the 1930s, mm -hmm. um, the United States and China didn't agree on everything. But the then Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, did work with the governor of the central bank uh, and other senior officials in China to yeah. uh, try to persuade China to do some things that actually, from an American perspective, were stabilizing for the markets. And there have been other examples, the Ebola outbreak in 2014. If you think about the current pandemic, where there's so little cooperation and the two sides are actually hurling insults back and forth at each other. You know, in 2014, American and Chinese uh, researchers actually worked side by side in a Chinese laboratory that had been set up in Sierra Leone in West Africa. That's just unthinkable today. The next recording comes from an interview I conducted with Dr. Jia Daozhong from Beijing University in September 2020 on the then new phenomena of wolf warrior diplomacy and rhetoric in China's foreign relations. But we see a new feature on the, on the Chinese side uh, in, in terms of what's labeled wolf warrior rhetoric or wolf warrior diplomacy to punch back or in many ways proactively just strike out uh, and criticize the U.S. and other countries um, for their handling of the coronavirus or for their criticism of China. Um, what explains this new feature of Chinese communication to the world? Uh, that's certainly not a very high point in diplomacy uh, out of China. We should not be projecting our country as such. 
But uh, on the other hand, uh, need to be a little bit balanced. Uh, probably you also have a not so outspoken but salient uh, voice among those who are who give some credibility to engage in that kind of rhetoric. There is now saying in the presidential election platforms saying that China should pay for, for whatever the U.S. calculates its loss from the virus. Uh, so are you yeah. saying that, that this kind of pushback is appreciated in China, that China is not going to be pushed around like that? No, I think there is, uh, I need to be honest, I think there is that sentiment. Yeah. We went from one extreme, that's during the Obama administration, of having hundreds of dialogue mechanisms, and many of those were very poorly managed, with insufficient preparation on both sides, and many of them ended up being more ritualistic than yeah. sub substantive, mm -hmm. to today, whereby about the only thing left is a megaphone. We have to find the middle ground somewhere. In the next audio recording, recorded in September 2019, I interviewed Dr. Dao Wei from the Center for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University about his take on the presidential election of November 2020. We're moving into a political season in the United yes, States exactly. with a presidential campaign yes. coming up. Is it better for China if President Trump is reelected, or is it better for China if a Democrat comes to office? I think uh, the majority view here is uh, no matter who is in the or which party is in the, the I mean who is in the White House, uh, the the change the shift of U.S. China policy has already happened. We won't get back to the old days. So uh, of course we want the president, the future president, no matter it's a uh, it's President Trump or someone from Democratic Party, we want the the next administration to be more stable, to be more uh, predictable, uh, reliable. The following audio clip comes from an interview I conducted in December 2020, shortly after President Biden's victory in the U.S. presidential election. During the interview, I speak with Dr. Xia Tao from the School of International Relations at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Uh, I, I know uh, the get, polling industry now is getting devastated because of the, you know, the last election. Uh, many people are questioning uh, and the, uh, the veracity of this uh, polling numbers, but if you look at the Gallup data uh, in two, uh, in February 2020, that's just a short after the outbreak of uh, the pandemic, you had uh, a record low number of Americans who reported the favorable views of China. This is the lowest point, 33 percentage. This is lower than any point ever recorded by uh, Gallup. In the next recording held in March 2022, I interview Dr. Tong Zhao, senior fellow at Carnegie China, about U.S.-China relations one year into the Biden presidency. Tong Zhao, I want to turn to you. Um, what's your sense on the view from China broadly around the Biden administration's uh, China policy? I think the uh, mainstream Chinese view, uh, especially within the Chinese expert community, is that uh, Biden administration's policy uh, represents a quantitative ad adjustment, uh, not a qualitative change uh, compared to with the Trump era policy. Um, it's it's in, in a lot of sense it's a continuation of Trump policy, which reflects uh, a consensus of some sort uh, in in DC. That said, apparently. Uh, Biden administration appears to be more competent in uh, many issue areas. Uh, it is uh, able to uh, build back um, U.S.-led alliance and rely on allies and friends uh, for long-term competition with China, uh, which could present a more strategic uh, threat to China in the long run. Um, but I think uh, there is also this growing agreement that uh, actually the two sides are moving 
uh, closer um, in, in some, uh, you know, at the strategic level, they both agree they need to make more efforts to stabilize the bilateral relationship, uh, even though China doesn't like the term of building guardrails to the relationship. But uh, in essence, I think China shares that importance, uh, which was uh, you know, reflected in the discussion in the two presidents' first virtual summit meeting in November last year. The following recording comes from an interview with Huang Tiha in December 2022, assessing the outcomes of the meeting between President Biden and President Xi on the sidelines of the G20 meeting in Bali, Indonesia. As for C Biden meeting, I think it is a relief uh, to not only both countries, but also to the rest of the world uh, to see that in-person meeting has res been resumed uh, with some positive atmospherics, which uh, gives us hope. And, and that is hope only um, that mm. it could help reduce tensions and mitigate the risk of conflict, uh, especially over the Taiwan issue. And uh, there are some good assurances coming out from both President Xi and President Biden that they don't mm. want war and will take measures toward that end, including a resumption of some defense dialogues to increase transparency, manage competition, and perhaps explore cooperation out where possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would so all like to highlight that there is no magic touch here. Uh, the C mm -hmm. Biden meeting would not alter the course of strategic competition between the two great powers. Thank you for listening to the China in the World podcast. For more episodes and research, please go to carnegieendowment.org. This episode was produced by Nathaniel Schur with assistance from Wang Yuan Hong, Michael Malinconi, and Sama Kuba. The music was composed by Spencer Barnett.